We are live. Great, thanks, Ollie. And uh, good evening, everyone who's joined us online. Um, thank you for joining us for the candidate forum for the Central Ward Supplementary Election. Uh, we have all the candidates with us tonight, but unfortunately, uh, candidate Wayne Chow is an apology. Um, my name is Matt. This is unmuted. Yep. Can candidates hear me still? Great. Um, my name is Matt Pinnigard. I'm the Chief Executive of the Local Government Association in South Australia, and it's my pleasure to be your facilitator for this evening. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to Elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land, and we acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Um, before I continue, I'd just like to go over a few of the housekeeping items uh, for tonight. As I said, uh, candidate Wayne Chow is an apology, uh, but all the other candidates uh, are on Zoom. Um, please note that this forum is being recorded and live streamed via Facebook, and a recording will be made available uh, on YouTube after this event. Um, candidates will each have an opportunity to share their vision for the central ward prior to being asked questions from local residents and precinct groups, along with questions that are received via the Facebook stream. Uh, I invite anyone participating via the Facebook stream to submit any questions they would like answered through the comments. Um, and these questions will be dealt with after the questions from the local resident and precinct groups uh, time permitting. Um, and for fairness of ease of, and ease of listening, candidates' microphones uh, will be muted until it is their turn to speak. And should a candidate wish to speak, um, I encourage them to use the raise hand function via Zoom. Um, when you are invited to speak, uh, please wait a moment before doing so to ensure that your microphone has been turned on. Um, and note it, it, it's very difficult for this to be a debate with eight, uh, seven candidates and doing it by Zoom. Um, so it'll really be a, a Q and A opportunity. Um, the City of Adelaide Central Ward covers the central city central business district and is bordered by the River Torrens to Kettiful Terrace, Sir Donald Bradman Drive, uh, Guja, Wright and Angus Streets to the south and the Park Terrace. It is a diverse and dynamic ward, uh, home to Rundle Mall and the central business district, the North Terrace Cultural Boulevard, and education and biomedical precincts, the market precinct and Chinatown, as well as the east and west ends, along with a growing residential population. Um, as a result of the resignation of Sam Abiyad, a supplementary election is being conducted for this ward uh, and with ballot packs already delivered to registered voters. We will shortly hear more about the process for, from David Gully, he's the Deputy Commissioner of the Electoral Commission of South Australia. However, I'd like to first invite the Right Honourable, the Lord Mayor of Adelaide, Sandy Vashore, to open the forum. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you all. Mani Napudni, Nadlu Tampandi, Nadlu Ghana, Yatanga Takandi. In the language of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, I welcome you all and acknowledge that we're meeting on traditional country and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd also acknowledge that the first Wednesday of May has traditionally been the occasion for all Australians to commemorate those who have lost someone to domestic and family violence. And this year especially was to honour the memory of our First Nations sisters and their children. Um, so I'm actually going to invite you just to join me for a moment's silence um, as we, they are doing a virtual vigil uh, as we speak. Thank you. Um, so welcome everybody to uh, the inaugural online community forum for the City of Adelaide Central Ward supplementary election. Um, thank you to the candidates who have embraced this evening's online forum. Um, and also thank you Deputy Commissioner David Scully and Nicola Skiri for joining us tonight. And of course, our uh, MC Matt Pinnegar, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to moderate this evening's event, much appreciated. Um, 
I do welcome and acknowledge the candidates for the Central Ward Supplementary Election for putting your hand up to represent your community. Um, it can be a lot of hard work. It can take a lot of time, but it also can be incredibly rewarding being part of a process to grow our economy and strengthen our communities and, of course, create a diverse city full of unique experience that is the Adelaide that we know and love. This evening's online forum will give ratepayers, residents and business owners in the city central ward the opportunity to meet you all, um, those standing for election, and also to ask some questions. Um, it's really important, of course, that ratepayers are able to make an informed decision about who they want to represent them in making decisions for the future of our city. Um, this evening's online forum um, is, was the best way we knew how uh, in these moments of innovation during COVID-19 for people to get to know the candidates before voting closes on May the 11th. Um, I was recently asked what values I believe makes a good councillor or ma what makes a good councillor. Um, and to me, you know, a good councillor is hardworking, diligent, and understands how our city works and the needs of the city and are open to debate and discussion, the listening to the views of others. Um, they also need to be a really strong voice for their constituents and work collaboratively, uh, both inside and outside of the council to deliver for all of the city stakeholders, which are a very diverse group of stakeholders. Um, voters, of course, should expect their councillor to strive to make the city a better place. And that is for everyone, everyone who either lives here or works here, studies, visits, or simply comes to play. Um, there may not be that much playing at the moment, but as you know, we're surrounded by 750, 80 acres of beautiful parklands, and that has given a lot of joy to people over this period of people using the parklands to exercise and walk. Um, and it's been extraordinary to see how well they've been used over these last few weeks. I also believe that ratepayers should elect someone who is passionate about delivering services that improve our livability, that advance our prosperity, and also uh, um, stimulate sustainable economic growth in the city. The candidate who is successful uh, will join the council to represent the central ward up until the next election, which is in November 2022, and perhaps beyond that as well. Um, to say that COVID-19 has had a dramatic impact on the city of Adelaide is an understatement. Um, as you all know, much of the city's commerce takes place in the central ward. And so the successful candidate will also play an absolute vital role in deciding how we continue to support our community through this crisis, but also how we can drive a really fast recovery and the, uh, the effort to rebuild once we get out the other side of this, which is looking pretty good for South Australia. In February this year, the City of Adelaide developed the next four year strategic plan. And now more than ever, the strategic plan, plan outcomes will guide the city's recovery. So we will continue to strive for a strong economy, for thriving communities, for environmental leadership and a dynamic city culture. All the reasons that make Adelaide the truly beautiful and great place that it is. So with that, um, I'll hand over to our MC, Matt, uh, to provide just a few more details about how we can ask questions of candidates through this session and um, hand over to start the forum. I thank you all again for joining us. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor, for those uh, wise and encouraging words. Um, I would now like to uh, welcome Deputy Commissioner David Gully uh, and Elections Team Leader Nicola Skiri from the Electoral Commission of South Australia to talk about how the voting process will be is to be conducted. Uh, thank you, David and Nicola. Um, thank you, Matt. Um, the Honourable Lord Mayor, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, take part in what I think is, in my time, which is a long time, a first for local government elections, doing an, a, a live stream uh, session such as this for a, a supplementary election. And um, it just, I think it demonstrates how adaptable we can be when we've got uncertain and changing times put upon us. So we've certainly uh, found a whole new way of doing work. Uh, we've had a skeleton staff in our office right through the process. and. Uh, and, and we're ramping that up as we need to, but uh, clearly with the guidelines of health authorities and the government to uh, isolate and work at home, uh, 
this is our middle of our sixth week of doing so. So uh, it's something we've all become uh, a bit more used to and uh, it shows how, I said, how adaptable we all are at this. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to take part. Um, uh, as as uh, Matt mentioned, I've been joined by Nicholas Geary. Nicholas, uh, the appointed deputy returning officer for the Central Ward Supplementary Election for the City of Adelaide. And I'm sure that she will have already spoken personally to every one of the candidates. If not, you will have had emails and, and other correspondences from uh, Nicola. Um, so I'd welcome you to contact her at any time if you have any issues or email us at the uh, Commission's mailbox and we'll certainly help all we can. So I'm going to hand over to Nicola to just run through a few points about where we are at the moment, where we're moving over the next few weeks as we lead into the uh, the uh, sharp end of the election when we get to count votes and declare someone elected. So um, Nicola will take it from here. Thanks, David. Um, yes, I have spoken to all of the candidates, which has been good over the process. So obviously at the moment, um, as Matt mentioned earlier, voting material has gone out. So that went out to hit mailboxes starting from last Tuesday. Um, so we are now a week into that process. So we would expect that uh, everybody should have received their, their uh, voting material by now, depending on where, where they're located. Um, so we're in the process now of receiving those returns. And what we're doing is processing those returns the day after they are received. Now by processing, I mean um, just removing the ballot envelopes from the reply paid envelopes and um, doing a preliminary scrutiny to make sure they can be accepted into the count. Um, obviously no ballot material, ballot papers or anything is uh, removed at this stage. So um, due to the current COVID-19 situation that's already been mentioned, um, we are holding off and we're doing that processing the day after we receive them. Um, these numbers are then put up onto our website so that you can track day by day what, uh, what we've received. So as of uh, what we processed today, which is what we received as of yesterday, we are at 622 votes, which is just over 5.3% so far. So um, not tracking too bad. And I do want to stress, as it has already been mentioned, that this is only for central board. Um, for this particular supplementary election. Now, again, uh, we would expect that most voters, uh, most uh, electors, sorry, have received their voting material by now. If, however, they haven't, um, we can organise a reissue of voting material for them. So all that is required is to simply complete a form um, and that needs to come into us and we can organise to, uh, to send out that reissue material now. We do have uh, those forms available on our website. Um, they can also call us directly at the at the election commission, and we can we can issue those. Or alternatively, you can go into council, and they also have them at their customer centre, which is located on Fury Street. So um, that is a fairly simple process. But please don't hesitate to get in touch if uh, there are any concerns about that. So. Next phase is our close of voting finishes at 12 o'clock on Monday the 11th of May. Now I must stress that um, in order for votes to be counted and accepted, uh, they must reach us by that deadline. So 12 noon, Monday the 11th of May, we simply cannot uh, accept any ballot material out, um, after that time. Um, so we, I do want to just stress that for electors to make sure they allow for uh, the postage uh, time if they are posting that material back to us. Um, if you do start to get worried about that time or it does start to get closer to uh, the close of voting, particularly as we get into next week, I would suggest that the best option would be to uh, take that voting material into council uh, because there is a ballot box there uh, where that voting material can go into. So that just ensures that we don't have, uh, have any issues with receiving that material late. Um, so after that, close of voting, 12 noon, Monday, the 11th of May, we are going to conduct the scrutiny and count from 9 a.m. on Wednesday, the 13th of May. Uh, now that is a little bit of a delay compared to what we would normally do, but again, it's due to the extra contingencies we've put in place for COVID-19. So we can isolate that material, then do that preliminary uh, processing before the count starts from 9 a.m. on Wednesday morning. But again, I will stress that between that time, uh, the ballot material is securely stored and no ballot, uh, no ballot papers are removed from the envelope until that scrutiny and count time. So um, I want to really stress that. Now, 
obviously with the, the current situation, we are putting additional plans and measures in place for that scrutiny and count, um, as we have done throughout the period of the election doing some things like this um, from a more remote perspective. But for the scrutiny and count, we definitely are taking into consideration the advice from health authorities and we're monitoring those plans um, as we move forward. And that includes things like um, the way we've got the room set up, uh, the number of people we're allowed to have in the room, given social distancing, uh, you know, the, the four square metres per person and ensuring there's 1.5 metres between people and all of those sorts of things, making sure that we've got adequate cleaning and uh, personal protective equipment and all of that sort of thing available for the screening count. So I would like everybody to rest assured that we are taking all those measures into consideration and we'll be putting those in place for the safety of you know, our staff as well as scrutineers um, there. And so obviously with the social distancing measures, we um, are limited with how many people we can have in, in the room. Uh, the count will be conducted here at the Electric Commission SA office um, on Light Square. Um, so candidates have been advised that uh, they will be limited to one scrutiny at a time in the count room. Uh, they, they are more than welcome to appoint multiple scrutineers, but only one in the count room at that time. So that's just going to help to make sure that we can uh, abide by those, uh, those regulations. So a fair bit of information I've just gone through in a fairly short period of time, but you can visit our website for further information. Our website, um, ecsa.sa.gov.au, so exa.sa.gov.au. And on there, we've got all sorts of information from the ward map to see whether you are actually in central ward, full election timetable. Uh, there's information about all the candidates on there. You can get the reissue forms on there. And again, um, importantly, it does also show the, uh, the daily returns and where we're at those. Yeah, thanks, Nicola. A um, couple, of, couple of points I'd just highlight from what Nicola's given to us there is, is that uh, we're five days in. There's still 10 days of mail processing to be done. So. So with a bit over 5% at the moment, um, we've still got a bit of time. Uh, we think that the, the higher returns haven't come in yet. The, the mail's still being delivered over the last day or two. So I'd expect that we should you know, get close to our target of around 20% return rate, which is a figure Nicola quoted. We're basing that on the, the last supplementary election that was conducted for the area councillor in December 2015. Um, that return was exactly 20% uh, return. So. Uh, the return rate for a supplementary election is always lower than a periodic election where there's a mayor or Lord mayor election because they're far more high profile events and, and it does, uh, our statistics show that the turnout rates in a council election where there's a mayor or Lord mayor contest, there is a far higher turnout. Um, the reissue material, um, Nicola mentioned that. So if a person hasn't received or they've lost or they've spoiled their ballot material, they can get a reissue done. They need to sign a declaration to the effect that it's been lost, spoiled or not received. Uh, and understanding some of the business uh, proprietors who might not be in the CBD at the moment not to get their mail, that they could certainly ask for a reissue and we'll mail a reissue material out to another address to them. Just an important thing for people to remember, under the legislation, if you ask for a reissue and sign a declaration, we must reissue the material too and it automatically cancels the original material issue. So we've got all those things identified we know which was the first or a reissue or subsequent reissue. Any reissue will cancel any previous material. Should that come back, that will be rejected. And we, we can do investigations if someone tries to vote more than once. Um, Nicola also mentioned about um, no ballot papers will be moved from envelopes. That's clearly that the declaration envelopes with the certificates on them and the ballot papers sealed inside will be maintained in that state until we start the scrutiny in front of scrutineers. However, you might, if you come and scrut if your scrutiny has come to the count, they may well see some ballot papers in an envelope that aren't in the declaration envelope. Please be sure that that's the way the elector sent them back. Um, if the elector sends the envelope back and the ballot papers aren't sealed inside the declaration envelope, the legislation requires that we reject that envelope in totality. Similarly, if people put uh, a husband or wife or, or partners put all their ballot papers into one envelope, when we open that envelope, if there are more ballot papers than should be in it, which is one ballot paper, the whole envelope must be rejected. So it's important that people, if they do receive um, pairs of envelopes, that they put their ballot paper back into their own declaration envelope. Don't think you're saving money to the council. If you want, you can actually return both the declaration envelopes into one reply paid. That will save some postage costs. Clearly do that, but don't put all your ballot papers in the one declaration envelope. That will invalidate your vote. Uh, 
Uh, and finally, uh, we would just like to wish all of the candidates the best of uh, luck with the uh, contest and their campaign. And uh, we look forward to uh, getting on with the sharp end of the process and uh, giving the council another member to sit amongst their, uh, their current membership. So thank you, Matt. Great. Um, thank you, David and Nicola, for that very thorough explanation of the process. Um, now we're going to move to the main event. We will proceed with candidate introductions. There are eight people contesting the vacant central ward position, each with their own experience and motivations for nominating for council. Our candidates will each be given three minutes to outline their vision for the central ward, and a bell will ring when there are 30 seconds remaining. For fairness, I'll invite each candidate to speak in the order in which they appear on the ballot. Um, and I would now like to welcome our first candidate, Stuart Whiting. Okay, good evening. Um, thank you for the introductions and thank you for, oh, thank you for organizing this evening's session. Um, and thank you for everyone who's um, joining on this uh this evening to find out about the candidates um first of all yes yeah, stuart whiting i i don't live in the um i don't live in adelaide city um i live in the whole fast, hold fast bay area um myself with my son travel into the city on a regular basis to uh to work to study um, for entertainment purposes um and i decided to put myself forward as a candidate uh, um, growing uh, disappointment at the the current uh, the seeming inability to come to a, for the council to come to a decision on the implementation of a of an east west bikeway across the city. Um, but there's clearly been um, a lot of study, um, and the, there was recommendation for a, for a, a bikeway on Flinders Franklin. Um, hasn't happened so yeah so disappointing and and that was probably the main reason that motivated me to, to put myself forward to see whether i can whether there's anything we can do about that um i travel through the city by bicycle um regularly so it's important to me personally um as a former committee member of bicycle institute of south australia um i recognize that it's a strategic aim and, and I won't go into, uh, I say this isn't necessarily a debate, so I won't go into all the, the many positive and economic benefits that, that active transport and cycling brings to businesses um, and residents of the city. But um, I say that I, I feel that that's something that uh, I'd like to get involved in. Um, I'm a fully independent candidate. Um, so I haven't involve myself in any of the wheeling and dealing um, to align myself with other candidates um, and preferences. So yeah, I, I don't know anybody anything um, in, in those respects. Um, I'd like to see Adelaide, I'd like to see Adelaide um, as progressive, vibrant and attractive. So be it for, for, for businesses. 30, 30 seconds, Stuart. Okay, um, and you know, as a as as a place that people want to stay, um, I recognise there's lots of interest groups amongst traders, residents, the Parklands Association. So any decision that I make will be based on information provided by the council and representations of um, of those other groups. Difficult times, and we'll certainly uh, do anything that we can see that the economy recovers quickly. Okay. The three minutes has gone very quickly. Thanks. Thanks very much, Stuart. Um, Wayne Chow is an apology tonight, so we'll move to the next candidate, which is Greg Mackey. And my time starts now. <clears throat> Evening all. Um, those of you who know me well know that I'm driven to serve and that I believe passionately in the dignity of service. It is my vocation. I learned this from 25 years in retail. I honesty, 
research and product knowledge, features, advantages and benefits. And I carried this ethos forward into my cultural leadership and public sector leadership journey. At my heart, I'm a small businessman and this just happens that my business is culture. I've learned over many years that people want honesty, reliability and integrity. And these have been the hallmarks of my nearly 40 years working in the city of Adelaide's central ward. I've worked as an executive for a large corporation, Meyer, and been self-employed with my own business in principal cellars in Adelaide's West End. I've anchored the longest running artist run gallery in South Australia, Zone Gallery. As co-founder and former president of the Adelaide West End Association, I created value adds through the spearheading of an artist-led urban renewal strategy that in its time attracted to the West End, the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra, Arts SA, the Adelaide Festival of Arts and the Adelaide Fringe. We created Shop Art, effectively the forerunner to re renew Newcastle and renew Adelaide. And we reversed the decline of the West End without millions of dollars of taxpayer subsidy. Between 2000 and 2003, as an elected member of the City Council, I served the communities of Adelaide with passion, with energy and conviction. Back then, we were only eight elected members plus a Lord Mayor, and all of us were citywide. My stakeholders were not only the arts, they were shopkeepers, central market traders. I chaired the central market committee for a few years. My stakeholders were residents, the design industries and business. I also spoke up for the homeless and for the First Nation and for First Nations Australians. I feel compelled once again to step up and serve and advocate and to provide a model of leadership that builds coalitions and shared understandings and that plays a part in helping to navigate our city, our community and our economy through what will clearly be the worst recession in several generations. I do not want to represent a city of boarded up shop fronts. We must do everything possible to ensure that good businesses come through the dark time and come through more resilient and better able to thrive in the new frontiers that await us. We must ensure that in the scramble to reduce expenses, that we do not lose sight of our role and purpose as a capital city in a city state. We need to harness, we need to done. Just saying, sorry, Greg, we had you on mute for the last 15. Unfortunately, if you wanted to repeat anything. Oh, uh, Brooke, thank, thank you very much. Um, we need a city-state summit that brings together the leadership of our major sectors and the City Council must work hand in glove with the state government to ensure that we target the right drivers of recovery and growth. We cannot do this alone and we must discourage reckless spending for fear of being accused of not doing enough. In times of crisis, we need to know our values and we need to build the greatest level of consensus going forward, not vitriolic division. Democracy deserves a little dignity. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Greg. Uh, next up is Gareth Lewis. Over to you, Gareth. Thanks, Matt. And uh, thank you, Lord Mayor and all the other candidates. Um, it's an interesting uh, forum, obviously. Um, my name is Gareth. Uh, uh, up until uh, this time last week, I was a publican at the uh, King's Head Hotel, amongst other things. Um, and I've been uh, running hospitality business in the city of Adelaide uh, since 2005. Uh, since 2007, um, uh, we've been uh, running large scale music events in the city. Uh, and over that time, we've employed literally thousands of people um, through the venues the, uh, and the festivals. Uh, I've, I've lived, um, I own property, I, I worked and, uh, and I play in the city, probably a little bit too much play sometimes, and I love Adelaide. Um, I think it's the best city in Australia um, and I'm proud to call Adelaide home. Uh, unfortunately, Adelaide is probably the hardest place to do business in Australia. Um, regardless of the, uh, the current COVID situation, um, Adelaide and uh, South Australia wasn't exactly humming along beautifully a couple of months ago. Now it's uh, barely humming along at all. I'm standing for the, uh, for, the, for the sole purpose of helping what I like to call the vibrant industries of, of South Australia. Those are hospitality, retail, events and the arts um, recover and rebuild from, uh, from the, what they're going through now. It's gonna take quite a long time. Um, it's probably much longer than this current term of council. 
and it is the biggest challenge facing council from here on in in this term. Um, of course, we all, and I, I think I speak for <laughs> all candidates are running, or I hope I speak for all candidates are running uh, an election like this. Um, we all agree that council needs to be green. It needs to protect our parklands, protect our heritage. Um, it needs to promote alternative transport, um, and it needs to uh, do so, you know, all while they're you know performing their civic duties of picking up your rubbish. I don't think any of those things are exactly what this election is about. However, I think this election, uh, more so than anything else, is about the challenges that we're going to face on the other side of the coronavirus pandemic. Now, I won't take up too much of more of the three minutes because that's really succinctly why I'm why I'm here, and why I want to be an advocate for those industries that really make up the fabric of our city and encourage the hundreds of thousands of people each week to visit our capital city, not just the people that live, work and play there all the time, but the whole state. So thank you all. Thanks very much, Gareth. Um, our next candidate is uh, Doha Khan. So over to you, Doha. Hi, so my name is Doha. Um, and nominating for the central ward for me comes out of a vision of politics that is responsive and representative of the community that it serves. For a while now, it's not really been everyday people who have controlled our lawmaking chambers across the country. Um, and that's been made very obvious in a number of recent national debates, including the ones that are happening in our very own Adelaide City Council chamber. We've seen dirty politics play out behind the scenes. We've seen weeks and weeks of infighting. And we've seen our councillors lose sight of the bigger picture. They've lost sight of who they represent and who they really work for and call it youthful optimism, but democracy can be better than that. And it should be better than that. We need a new generation of politics, one that is from the outside and is ready to put people first. And I'm gonna be frank and address the elephant in the room. Um, I admit that I do not have the same experience as some of the other property developers and corporate lobbyists and bankers that are in this race, but I do have experience in advocacy, in delegating and in organizing. As an organizer with the School Strike for Climate organization, I've worked with people from all sides of politics. I've been to the Capitol, I've spoken with people who agree with me and people who don't. Um, we've sat down, discussed ideas and found common ground and a way to move forward. I have experience in bringing communities together, advocating for their interests and fighting for democracy to be truly representative. My candidacy is about bringing this endeavour into another front. As someone who's grown up in Adelaide, who's played and studied in Adelaide, my love for the city runs deep and I want nothing more than to see it thrive. And this can only happen when the city's leaders are honest, transparent and are committed to serving the community and only the community. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Doha. Um, our next candidate is uh, Nathan Payne. So over to you, Nathan. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And of course, thank you to all of the fellow candidates. I'm running for the central ward vacancies. I believe I have the right skills, the right time and the ability to work across the chamber to help manage the council through this current period of turmoil. I'm a resident, one of the very few candidates who actually lives in the city. I'm a small business owner and I'm a father raising children in the city. The city is very much a part of my DNA. As a resident, I want to ensure that our streets and neighbourhoods are safe, that they're clean, that the streets are well maintained. As a business owner, I want to ensure that our rates are spent wisely and that they're spent in support of delivering the greatest economic benefit for our community. And most importantly, that we're supporting our business community at this time of difficulty. The business communities are those that carry the majority of the rate burden but is one that is uh, really hurting badly right now. As a father whose children go to school in the central ward, I wanna ensure that we protect our parklands and improve our green spaces. The places that, that me and my family uh, go to kick a soccer ball, relax and recreate. They are the lungs of our city. My core values and the values that I will bring to council are trust, honesty and integrity. In terms of my vision for the city, I want a city that is vibrant, full of life all year round, one that is open, uh, I want a city that is safe with clean and green streets. I want a city that supports and nurtures entrepreneurs and fosters and attracts more businesses and more jobs. I want a city filled with opportunity and filled with optimism. I want a city that is accessible for all, that supports both a daytime and a nighttime economy, and one that attracts people from around the metropolitan area 
from a, across the country and from around the globe. Most importantly, I want a council that has a real and strong plan for supporting our residents and lifting up our business community during this time of need. That is why in addition to our already announced $5 million economic stimulus package, if elected, I'll be pushing for council to provide further rate support for, uh, for uh, non-residential ratepayers who are, who are struggling during this time of need. Our businesses are dying without support. It's, um, without support, they will be uh, shutting down and they won't be reopening when we get to the other end of this crisis. Councils uh, only spend about 2.5% of its budget to date on providing stimulus for those businesses. I think we can do more. I think we must do more. I think we need to make sure that we put non-residential ratepayers right at the centre, right at the heart of council's policies so that we can support them during this crisis and as they come out the other side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathan. Uh, Nathan, our next uh, candidate is uh, Darren Gisham. Over to you, Darren. G'day, everybody. Um, thanks for, for still participating in what I'm sure is going to be the uh, local election uh, online political forum of the year. Uh, we stand at a critical juncture in the LA Central Board. Decades of policy mismanagement by local and state government has left the board operating well below its potential, and it's time to change that. Uh, my name is Darren Gitchum and I'm the owner of the Crown and Scepter Hotel. I'm a centrist, a pragmatic decision maker, a long-term resident and business owner in the Central Ward. I'm also the candidate to bring the change of representation that the Central Ward so desperately needs on council. My candidacy is a unique one in this field. I have no ideological masters or interest groups. As a centrist, I'm empathetic to all opinions and make decisions based on merit. What's for the greater good? Sometimes I'm conservative, sometimes I'm progressive but always I'm logical, thoughtful, and put the voters first. Let's start by taking the elephant out of the room. COVID-19 has been challenging and continue to be challenging for all Australians for some time to come. But let's all be aware of one thing. COVID-19 is not the source of all the problems in the central board. And this pandemic has exposed far too easily the deficiencies and inefficiencies, structural flaws of the local economy and the Adelaide City Council as part of that economy is not exempt from this. Unlike some, I do see this as an opportunity for council to reinvent itself, to take stock of impetuous and misguided decisions of the past and learn from the mistakes. The city council more than ever can play a better and more effective role as a facilitator in the post shutdown economic recovery. This may be in the guise of deferred or reduced council rates, a genuine assessment of the transport mix in the city streets to create better functioning and inviting streetscapes more efficient operation of parking that benefits retails, hospitality and general business at all times of the day, not just after 6 p.m. every night. Promoting opportunities for new construction in vacant and dilapidated sectors of the city to bring vibrancy, rejuvenation and job opportunities. Taking a wholesale look at the city planning efforts to ensure a long-term view that promotes opportunities for all ideas rather than a policy creation that's seemingly driven by flavour of the month ideology and political sugar hits. The City Council also has an important role to play in the community, primarily focusing on essential services, community centres, bins, roads, potholes, parks, the local government basics that don't nearly get talked about enough in elections, but make up 90% of our problems and gripes as voters and waste a lot of money. You've got 30 seconds to go. We need a council that gets out of the way for great ideas, creative organisations and people with get up and go. It's time for a council that works for its people, not seemingly in spite of them at times. A council that focuses on improving public spaces at fiscally affordable rates to taxpayers. A council that better engages the state government to help solve problems mostly unique to the city like homelessness and street-based substance abuse problems. Lastly, I'll say this. The central board accounts for over 70% of the council revenue. Before you cast your vote, ask yourself this question. As a city council customer, which you are, do you feel like you get value for money? Thank you for your consideration. Thanks very much, uh, Darren. And uh, the last candidate is uh, Malvina Weira. So over to you. Just wait by a moment while we unmute you. Thanks. Thanks everyone. And thanks for tuning in. My vision for Adelaide is that of a city that is progressive, sustainable and inclusive. It's of a city where we look after each other as well as local businesses. I'm running for Central Ward because I think this is our opportunity to hit the reset button. I would be a fresh start for the award and a new voice on council so we can let go of past stalemates and move on to bigger and better things. 
I'm a resident in the ward, so I want to see uh, our community have a stronger voice on council. As we recover once this pandemic subsides, I think it's vital that we have somebody in town hall who is representing both residents and businesses. I'm also running because I want our council uh, to better reflect that which is best about our city. Adelaide has a proud history of being a forward thinking city and has a strong um, social conscience at its heart. Our local businesses reflect that, our community reflects that, and our council should too. And there's a lot to love about Central Ward, so I'll try to keep it brief. I think that uh, we're rather unique in that we're in the middle of the CBD, but there's a strong sense of community and connectedness. And I think that's really special. We have beautiful green spaces. We have um, passionate uh, community groups. We have iconic markets and innovative local businesses to be proud of, not to mention amazing bars, uh, live uh, music venues, um, and all of the festivals that we have the privilege of hosting. So it's truly the heart of the city. I have so many ideas and issues that I'd love to work on should I be elected, but I think the absolute priority has to be ensuring that any recovery post COVID-19 is a just recovery. So this means that we are not leaving people or businesses behind, but it also means that we take a serious look at what we can do better because we don't have to return to a status quo that while it was good for many, wasn't good for all. We can use this as an opportunity to have a city that works for all of us. This is our chance to invest in affordable housing and end homelessness. We've seen that it can be done and we're leading the way currently. It's an opportunity to make our city more accessible for pedestrians and cyclists, improving infrastructure and access to businesses and improving the health of our city. During isolation, I think um, we've all seen how lucky we are to have the parklands and all the amazing green space in our city. And that uh, renewed appreciation is our chance to make sure we protect the green space we have and innovate to increase it. It's also a moment to consolidate and look at the amazing universities and tertiary education institutions we have in our city and take up some of the uh, new and innovative ideas of young entrepreneurs and young professionals uh, to make our city a more modern city. And also importantly, to keep young talent here. It's also an opportunity for a new level of transparency and openness on council, which is vital with more meaningful and consistent community engagement. Uh, it would be an incredible privilege to represent you on Town Hall, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Malvina, and thank you all candidates. Um, we will now proceed to the Q&A session. Um, and throughout the course of this evening, we have been receiving questions uh, from the community who want to hear from you. I think we hit about 150 people watching this, so um, well done. Um, should you wish to speak to any question, please press or raise the hand button and we will unmute you when it is your time to speak. And please note that you're only allocated one minute to respond to a question. Um, the first question that uh, we'll have tonight is from Yvonne Mirendi of the Gr Grote Street Business Precinct. And she's asking, homeless people in the city have sought shelter around the Central Market Precinct. What services do you think councils council should put in place to support those experiencing homelessness? Sorry. Okay, so Malvina, um, if, you're, if you're happy to go, go first. Great, uh, thanks so much. I think that's a great question. And I think it's something that's um, really come to light uh, during this pandemic is that we've actually seen uh, the capability of our state to um, house and shelter more than uh, about 400 uh, homeless people and rough sleepers. So we know that it's doable. I think a great thing is seeing that we finally progressed with um, uh, enabling the Hutt Street Centre to, to upgrade their facilities, which is fantastic. I think uh, Adelaide Council is doing great work with the uh, Zero Project, which is fantastic. But I also think we can be doing more faster. Um, again, the pandemic has shown it's possible. And I think we particularly can be helping to facilitate more connectivity between varying services. Um, that exists around the city and getting people into secure shelter faster. Um, it's a basic human right. Uh, housing shouldn't be a community, uh, a commodity rather. Um, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, we, there's so much that council could be doing, particularly in facilitating. 
Great. Thanks very much for that. I think Gareth is next. Um, if other uh, candidates want to use the virtual hand on the participant uh, side screen, that would be great. So over to you, um, Gareth. Thanks, Matt. Um, and look, I want to echo a, a little bit of uh, what Malwina said. Um, you know, it is a responsibility of all tiers of government to tackle the homelessness issue. Um, and and absolutely, the uh, the decision last night to allow Hutt Street to um, improve their facilities is uh, was should be a no-brainer. Um, the state government has, well, I saw Stephen Marshall say yesterday that he's committed to uh, attempting to rehouse all of the people who are currently in temporary accommodation in hotels, um, which is actually more than the registered amount of rough sleepers in the city. So if the state government can commit to that, to, to that then that should uh, alleviate a lot of the problem for council and for Good Street in particular. Um, the, the role of council, uh, however, should, uh, should lie in policy that doesn't uh, promote the um, ostracisation of these uh, uh, of these people, um, you know, things like the dry zones, which move the problem from uh, from area to area, are just are just doing that, just kicking the can around um, defensive uh, de defensive architecture of street furniture and that sort of thing. So those are the things the council can do. Um, we can't find everyone a home um, or a place to uh, place to live. That you know, it's generally the responsibility of the state government, but we can uh, we can definitely assist in the progressive and, and helpful policy. All right, thanks, Gareth. Um, Nathan, you did have your hand up. Um, did you want to say something? Sorry about that, small technical issue. Uh, look, I, I think it's also a great question. Um, state government has been very effective in, in housing people. And you know, I think that this is, uh, this is something that should continue. I mean, we need to make sure that uh, we are uh, housing those people who are, who are falling through the cracks. The Adelaide Zero project, the work in the city um, is, is a nation leading project and, and one that I think um, we need to make sure is turbocharged throughout this period of government, uh, this period of local council uh, and into the next. Thanks. I can't see any other hands up, so I'll move to the next uh, question. And this one is from Andrew Wallace, who's from the uh, Adelaide West End Association. Um, the Central Ward is the centre of the of the business in the city. The Rundle Street, Rundle Moor, Hindley Street axis is the commercial spine of that centre. Out of the three, Hindley Street is sometimes seen as the poor cousin. Uh, with sometimes indifferent attention from central ward councillors over the years. Until COVID-19, things were starting to move forward in the precinct. What will you do to build on the good work done in liquor licensing reform, placemaking, et cetera, to support the delivery and improvements needed on the street? How will you support the AWEA in achieving its 10-year community-led vision for Hindley Street to enable the whole commercial spine of the city to thrive from East Terrace to West Terrace. So we've got uh, Greg Mackey, if you'd like to go first, Greg. Um, <clears throat> sure, thank you. Um, West End is, has been a big part of my life and um, I was responsible for the formation of the Adelaide West End Association. Nobody, uh, well, many people see the potential of the of Adelaide's West End. I certainly do. Um, the ten-year vision for uh, that the West End Association has promulgated uh, is very good. Um, it uh, it understands where uh, Hindley Street fits in the cultural economy, cultural ecology, uh, and the society uh, of Adelaide. Um, it understands that it is an every nation's street. It understands that it has its challenges. It is a 24 hour economy. A 24 hour economy has three time zones. What, what um, it's now probably 20 years since the last major public realm enhancement there. And while uh, the, the immediacy of the COVID-19 budget impacts is, are going to render a lot of capital programs um, somewhat uh, it, on the back burner, um, I will certainly be advocating uh, um, Hindley Street's turn. Um, we have so much of the city going for us in the West End, uh, so much visitor accommodation, 
proximity to universities, to the convention center. Um, uh, we have an incredible opportunity for it to be the most diverse, eclectic, edgy, grungy, authentic uh, part of Adelaide that it has been in decades past. Great, thanks very much, Greg. And we've got uh, uh, Malvina followed by uh, Darren. Thanks, Matt. And I'd certainly like to um, agree with Greg's sentiments. I think um, the West End is a fabulous part of the city, but I definitely agree that it has been um, neglected at times, which is a shame because it's a really unique part of our city. Um, and the West End Association is right, that it certainly forms part of um, our economic spine. I think a big thing that we can do um, to, uh, to work towards um, improving the West End is, of course, uh, working with, with uh, um, the association and listening to stakeholders and the community. But I also think, um, more broadly speaking, it's vital that we start making the various um, parts of our city more connected and more accessible. And I actually think part of doing that is having uh, transport, uh, a better public transport and better transport connectivity so that we can actually get from one part of the city to another much more easily. And I think that certainly shows uh, in uh, that is lacking in the West End at the moment, although we've started to see um, some improvements. Great. Thanks very much. Um, we've got uh, Gareth next, followed by Nathan, uh, maximum one minute each. Thank you for the question. Um, absolutely, the West End and um, Andrew referred to Hindley Street in particular is is definitely part of that corridor of, of the city, uh, of commerce in the city. Um, and the late night economy, uh, which is um, the reason uh, that many tens of thousands of people, especially young people, visit our city each and every week and weekend especially. Um, that economy at the moment does not exist. So, uh, so to, you know, to, to achieve the things that um, are in that 10 year goal uh, and Andrew and his team at the, um, the West End Association are um, fantastic proponents of that area. But to achieve that, we need to first actually ensure that those businesses will survive and that they'll be here in six months, 12 months, two years time. Um, it is you know, the, the heart of the uh, late night economy. And if we lose that, we lose a vital part of our capital city. So, so yes, I agree um, you know, in, in terms of uh, place making and, and greening and making it a, a fantastic space to be at all times of the day, um, but uh, really need to you know, acknowledge that you know, it is the it is the late night heart of the city and, and we need to treat it as such. Thank you and my apologies. Um, Darren was actually next as well, so I'll go with Darren Gisham and then followed by Nathan Payne. Yeah, thanks, Matt. It's a, it's a good question. Look, the, I've worked in the West End for a long time in hospitality, and it's a it's a very unique part of Adelaide. Um, it has some very unique challenges historically because of what the West End, particularly Highley Street, has been. Um, it's made enormous leaps forward in the last 20 years from when I was at UniSA as a student to where it is now. And, um, you know, sort of uh, west of Morford Street, it's, it's a completely different place than what it used to be, and that's really positive. There are a lot more challenges that need to occur uh, that are facing us, um, particularly the hospitality industry and um, how we operate um, uh, that affects the nighttime economy. I think the number one thing with Highly Street has still with the nighttime economy is, is it safe? Is it clean? Um, do you feel okay going down there? Would you walk down Highly Street by yourself? A lot of people would say no still, um, unless you're 19 or 20. Um, and that's something we need to work on now. And that's going to be part of a bigger approach that's going to involve SAPOL, the Unlay City Council, and also the stakeholders within the street. Um, and I think, I think the policy is getting there. Um, I think there's probably some hard decisions about licensing decisions that need to be made. But um, I think anyone going onto the council needs to understand the nuances of liquor licensing before um, we start making bigger, broad statements and decisions. All right. Thanks for that. And over to Nathan, just uh, letting all candidates know there are plenty of questions. So over to you, Nathan. Um, thanks, Matt. And uh, you know, I would expect no lesser a question from, from Andrew Wallace. Um, been lucky enough to work with Andrew during my time at the Property Council, where we looked at you know, what are the opportunities to, to I guess, redesign and relife the West End. Uh, but realistically, the West End has been the poor cousin of the um, uh, in the city. We spend money on Rundle Mall, we spend money on 
uh, run the least. We, we spent money on uh, Vola Place, but we've actually not really invested anything at all in the West End. We've got lots of young entrepreneurs uh, trying to, to make a go in the West End, and they're not really being supported by council through the provision of the same level of public realm and the same level of, uh, I guess, sense of safety that you get from having well-lit uh, streets. So, you know, I, I think any council going forward needs to make sure that the number one capital works priority is the West End um, to make sure that it is a safe place for people to go and a place that attracts people uh, once we uh, and get through this crisis. Sorry, it's Stuart next or right. well, I think that we're moving on to the next question. So, and that is um, from Herman Chin from the Chinatown Traders. Um, Chinatown has the second largest foot traffic next to Rundle Mall. Upgrades of Chinatown are done in dribs and drabs and are disconnected. What would you like to see as part of a Chinatown facelift? followed by Greg and Stuart. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, we actually just need some money spent on the area. We, we actually need a long-term plan. Um, Goose Street is, and Grove Street are possibly the most devoid places of personality in, in the CBD. Um, Kasiri is near the absolute heart of the city, which is Victoria Square. Um, you have a situation where it's not a very appealing streetscape. Um, there does need to be some money literally just to beautify the area, um, to make it more appealing for traders, also for dining. I mean, Guja Street bats well above its average in its ability to draw people into the area with little to no involvement in council. It's actually a commend, it's commendable from the traders in the area how well they do with little support. Um, part of obviously the redevelopment of Federal Hall and the Market Arcade will help, help this scenario, but the entire precinct needs some some genuine commitment from the council to um, improve the area. That's right. Over to you, Greg. The uh, Victoria Square Arcade redevelopment is is going to take around about five years, and there's going to be a very considerable interruption to the business there. I know that council and the market authority will work their very, very best to ensure that the impact on um, trade for the central market traders is minimised. But that during that period, we should also be talking about a master plan for the central west. And by the central west, I mean everything west of Victoria Square, Tantanyanga, uh, and that should encompass Guja Street, Grote Street, and Franklin Street, and it should extend all the way down to West Terrace. Um, this is the area of greatest population growth for the future. It's the area of least development and least land use conflicts. The Balfour site was something I banged on about 20 years ago, uh, and the important and the, the opportunity to grow the local population who will make the central market their absolute local shopping precinct. Um, proximity uh, and convenience is what we've seen drive uh, a, a custom away from the central market over the last 20 years. We need to drive that back. And for Chinatown, that needs to become an extension of um, its value proposition. And that requires a decent master plan. Great. Thanks, Greg. Uh, over to you, Stuart. Um, sort of echoing some of Darren's comments there, um, I mean, some of the streetscape in these areas and I guess in the previous quick question regarding the, um, um, the West End, um, I think a lot can be done with streetscape. Um, and one of the, and as mentioned earlier, one of the key things that I'm interested in um, is promoting um, active transport, removing cars from the streets where possible. Um, and I think a lot can be done in that area. And I think it would really improve connectivity from east to west, um, north to south, and, and can really improve the, the, the placemaking um, throughout town. Okay. Great. Thanks very much. And Gareth, you had your hand up. Did you want to say something? Uh, 
Oh, sorry, you've gone to me. Um, look, I, I, most of my comments were echoed uh, in, in, in uh, what has been said in terms of a master plan. Um, I know specifically Chinatown um, has been hurting for much longer than the coronavirus pandemic has been around um, due to the, the, the press it got before then. So, so yeah, look, Chinatown does struggle. Munta Street in, in, in particular needs a whole heap of public money spent on it to upgrade it. I don't know whether um, the council is going to be able to afford to go through with their uh, central market master plan in a timely fashion now. So we need to put out a few spot fires and uh, and actually make some decent decisions with the money available to to make to beautify the area and to, and to bring people back there. Great, thanks very much for that. A bit of feedback there. Um, moving to um, questions from uh, Julie Morley from the East End uh, Coordination Group. And her first question is, are you a supporter of council working with business to create a marketing and promotion platform to drive business in the city of Adelaide? So you've got uh, Gareth first, uh, followed by Greg. Thanks, Matt. The short answer is absolutely. Um, it's uh, part of uh, part of the information that I've put out in um, in the um, uh, to all letterboxes in the central ward. Uh, the, the city council does have a lot of marketing collateral that it can put behind hospitality precincts, events, and anything to drive business back into the city. Um, they should be and they should be offering all of that at no cost to those people to to those people who are reopening business in the city. Everything from street flags. Um, on uh, lamp posts to murals to to advertising space on digital platforms and driving those digital platforms better uh, should be looked at yes me okay can't hear you Matt um uh, yes uh, Ab absolutely. The City Council for all of the villages of the City of Adelaide and North Adelaide has a hugely important role to play in the promotion of the precincts, uh, their characters, their personalities, and that extends to individual traders who, who light up the local community. Um, marketing dollars are the hardest things for individual businesses to, to garner. Marketing dollars are the absolute lifeblood of getting our story out there. We are competing with the Westfields. We are competing with the local strip shops, which are making a comeback in metropolitan Adelaide. Um, we absolutely must market the hell out of our unique distinctiveness and the character and personalities of each precinct. Uh, Malvina, over to you. Great, thanks so much. Uh, I'm in furious agreement with everyone else. We absolutely should be doing this. I would, like, you'd think it would be almost a, a core function of council to be working together with its communities to promote those communities and those businesses. And I think particularly because not just as Greg said that uh, marketing money is hard to come by, but actually marketing experience and know-how. And council does have access to those resources, to that knowledge and to that information and it should be sharing it with, with um, businesses in the city, um, particularly uh, as we come out of this pandemic to make sure that we can make a strong recovery and that we're not leaving our small and local businesses and particularly new businesses behind. Thank you for that. Um, over to Nathan, followed by Doha. Uh, thanks, Matt. And uh, look, I, I think without question, the answer to the to the current problems that we're going through is is, is through cooperative uh, behaviour with council working with uh, with trader groups like the East End Coordinating Group. The simple reality is we've been losing we've been losing foot traffic and we've been losing demand for some time now. It's preceded the uh, the current crisis, uh, and what we need to, and we know that retail spending is 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 quite sticky. We've been losing these people to Westfields. We've been losing these people to the Parade and to Unley. We need to have a plan for how we're going to be bringing people back, not just the ones that we're shopping here, but bringing more people back into the city to spend money in our retail shops, to spend money in our restaurants, to, to get the life back on the streets of Adelaide. Thanks for that. And uh, now over to you, Doha. That is a fantastic question. And I do think um, a key strategy to um, 
move forward is to use technology. Um, the council's previous ma marketing events, sorry, attempts have been um, lackluster at best, and it's really time to bring in the experts um, and moving forward, use much more innovative and technology driven ways to um, direct traffic and business to our precincts. Uh, Darren, last we've got Darren before the next question. Over to you, Darren. Look, I think it's an absolute no-brainer that council need to be involved in promoting their local traders and suppliers. I don't think you're going to find anyone running for a council who doesn't agree with that. The bigger question is, is what's past that? You know, we clearly, as everyone said, we, we feel we have a problem with getting people into the city. We need to get more people into the retail stores and hospitality, pubs, clubs, cafes, as opposed to going to Westfields in suburbia. But when it costs you $24 to park your car in the CBD for a couple of hours when you want to do some retail shopping and you can go to a Westfield and it's free, there's no incentive for people to come in. So we need, as a council, to have a bigger picture approach in how we address these issues and not just put Band-Aids over brilliant ideas at the moment and look wholesale at how we are getting people to come in. If we don't address that, you can spend millions on marketing and it will not make a functional difference. So what we need first is a bigger plan of the functionality of business. Thanks for that. I'm gonna move on to another question from uh, Julie Morley from the East End uh, Coordination Group. Um, and this is, what are your ideas and plans for economic stimulus in the wake of COVID-19? And how do you propose council assists businesses in the reopening and recovery stage? Um, again, uh, one minute for anyone that likes to speak, just noting that we do have at least another seven or eight questions to go. Um, we've got uh, Gareth followed by Nathan. Thanks, Matt. Um, Again, uh, the, uh, the the most important thing, the most important time uh, of this crisis will be the recovery time. Um, currently, the council, I believe, is not doing enough financially for our traders um, and for the recovery of our vibrancy. Um, the council needs to, at a bare minimum, uh, forgive its current quarter rates. I know, uh, you know, Nathan's suggested before that um, it needs to up the ante in terms of the amount of dollars it's spending um, relative to its state and federal government counterparts. They are a tier of government. They need to pull their weight. Um, and we need to you know, potentially go into debt to do that. That's just the reality of the situation we're in. So we need to spend money. The council needs to approve the spending and raise the debt ceiling and then look at the major projects that they have on the shelf at the moment and assess whether they need to be done in the next two years or not. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Nathan. Thanks, Matt. And I, I couldn't agree more with, um, with what Gareth just said then. You know, I've, I'm on record as saying that we need to have a stimulus program, one which injects cash directly into the, the tills of our retailers and our, our hospitality venues. Uh, I've, I've suggested that can be done by giving every city resident a $200 gift card, which they can only spend in small to medium enterprises in the city. This would direct 5 million bucks straight into the bottom line of our businesses. Uh, this would allow them to open their doors quicker and get jobs, get people back into uh, back into their uh, workplaces quicker. I think it's a, it's a vital role of council. Uh, they are a level of government. You know, we've got to be doing more to, pr to protect those that pay the rates year in, year out. Uh, and we need to be doing it now as we head into the recovery phase. Thank you, and uh, we've got Darren's put his hand up, so uh, over to you, Darren. We obviously need to have a, a serious look at rates. Um, I have council rates I have to pay, they're quite astronomical, um, as I do every year. I have, I have rates that need to be paid. Um, I don't think necessarily 100% relief on rates is actually gonna help anybody in the long term. I think deferral and then maybe and some reduction with deferral is probably what's needed because the Adelaide City Council still have an operating budget that they need as well. And they, they can't go into the kind of level of debt the state and federal government can. One of the things that we can look at doing is, as I just said, is looking at things like parking. How are we absolutely getting people to want to come into town? People are going to want to go out after this is all over. I don't think there's anyone in Australia who's not excited to go to a restaurant and catch up with their friends and, you know, maybe go to a bar and have a drink. But we need to look at what we're doing to actually get people in. Things like we currently have a parking app. 
can we find a way to adjust that piece of technology so if you park your car and pay for it through the app, a retailer can validate your parking and the council will pick up the cost of your parking. Same what you would get at a Westfield, same what you would get, you know, at a Centro, but you get it in the CBD and you only get the free parking if you spend money at a retail outlet or a restaurant or a cafe. Thanks very much for that. We've now got Malvina followed by Greg. Over to you, Malvina. Thanks, Matt. Um, I think uh, Darren actually said a lot of what I was uh, wanting to say, particularly around car, being, uh, car parking. We are a bit of a city of uh, car parks and they're expensive and they can actually also make it quite difficult to access businesses in, in a way uh, when you either have short car parking or you can't really see storefronts because there's lots of car parking in the front. So I think that's one thing that uh, we can address. Um, that hasn't been covered. But I also think another thing we can look at is providing security for businesses that have um, particularly like unique uses um, and unique premises. And I'm thinking of live music venues in particular at the moment. We're all missing, I think, going out and hearing some local acts right now. But particularly, I think if we can protect their leases and their spaces, which I think if, if they lose and are taken over by some sort of other business or a developer, um, uh, then that's kind of gone forever. So council should be looking at ways to support them. What is really the cultural heart of Adelaide as well. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Greg. Um, there's a bit of a paradox uh, here that we face and, and I'm absolutely was very interested, Darren, in um, what you had to say. Uh, uh, city, after the loss of the Wingfield dump in, the, in around about 2007, eight, and the, the rivers of gold uh, that flowed as net profit into the coffers of the city council. After that, car parking uh, is the next biggest cash cow that drives the revenue base of the city of Adelaide. Um, it, it's obviously not quite as big as rates, uh, but it is pretty damn close. And so working the supply and demand levers caref it has to be done very, very carefully because if we still want the city to be able to pay for the infrastructure enhancements, uh, the social programs, the, the community stuff that is a responsibility of Capital City Council, then we, we actually need to work those levers very, very intelligently. Um, stimulus that drives demand rather than necessarily just puts a dollar in the in the till of a trader once off um, is probably a better way to go. Um, it, it's a series of little levers that can be pulled uh, that stimulate supply and stimulate demand. We've have, we will have an oversupply of businesses looking for customers. We need to drive the demand that will bring those customers in. Parking Thanks. is... Sorry, thank you, uh, Greg. I'm going to move to um, unattributed questions. Um, uh, the first one is uh, the City of Adelaide is uh, home to some 27% of South Australia's state and local heritage places. How do you view these buildings in the city's growing skyline and should they be supported to be maintained by owners? I've got uh, Darren with his hand up, followed by Greg and Nathan. Uh, over to you, Darren. Thanks, Matt. Uh, my pub is in a 144-year-old heritage listed building that has an enormous amount of problems that comes with being heritage listed. But we love this building, as a lot of people do love heritage listed buildings. Look, there needs to be a reasonable discussion between what's residential heritage, what's commercial heritage. Um, there are some reasonable discussions to also to be had that say streetscaping is very important. Anything below behind a facade should be a reasonable discussion. And simply from the fact of, if you want buildings to be green and energy efficient, a 144 year old building is not the way to go. I assure you of that one. Um, you know, if you want buildings to have access to people who have disabilities or a wheelchair, then 144 year old buildings are brilliant for everyone but that group. So, you know, we need to have a reasonably conscious discussion about this and say streetscaping is important. We want to look and we want to maintain as much as we can. But, you know, from, from behind a building, can you build something that fits in with the community needs and maintains a level of, you know, face heritage, at least on it anyway? Brilliant. Thank you. We've got uh, Greg followed by Nathan. Document that has been the basic primer for heritage and managing the interface and the adaptive reuse of heritage across the world. It's the um, um, ECOMOS 
uh, Borough Charter, actually developed in South Australia, and it is it makes it very, very clear there is plenty of ways to capitalise on our, our heritage uh, assets and there is plenty of underdeveloped uh, land that is not locked into heritage listing in this city. We, we, we have to make sure that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater in the drive for uh, development. And rest assured, and I'm very, very proud of my track record on development in the two, in my term of council uh, 20 years ago. Uh, but I'm also very, very proud of my record on heritage and on parklands. These are not mutually exclusive prospects. They require intelligence and they require good design thinking. Great, thanks, Greg. We've got uh, Nathan next, followed by Malvina, and then we've got to actually move to some of the community questions um, who have been listening uh, to the forum. Uh, so first to Nathan, then Malvina. Uh, thanks, Matt, and uh, I, I totally understand where Darren's coming from. I'm, a, I'm also in a building which is, you know, built around the uh, start of uh, the, the major boom in Adelaide back in the, you know, back when we were settled. Uh, it's, it, it makes life a bit challenging. We need to make sure that we are protecting the heritage assets that are critical to the fabric of our city. Uh, we need to make sure that we're doing this in a sensible and rational manner. We need to make sure that, more importantly, we need to make sure that we're, we're actually celebrating those heritage assets. We tell people that, you know, why these assets are being protected, what makes them special. A lot of what, uh, a lot of what we have in state heritage assets, nobody even knows why they're, why they're special, why they're being protected. They just look at them and uh, and think that you know they're, they're sitting there not being used or not being loved. We need to make sure that we are supporting those, the owners of those assets. We need to make sure that we have rules in place to enable their their reuse uh, in a more sensible, efficient, and uh, effective manner. Thank you. Uh, now we have Malvina and uh, Doha, and then we'll move on to the community questions. Thanks, and I'm keen for the community questions, so I'll be quick. I think building on um, what the others have said, I think it's clear and absolutely I support um, uh, being proud and maintaining um, our heritage buildings in the city. But I think uh, one great thing that council should be looking into doing is supporting more um, uh, smart retrofits of heritage buildings so that, um, that that is true to the building's character and history, but um, brings it up to modern uh, standards, particularly for accessibility, so that we can actually maximise uh, community use, knowledge and access to our city's history. So I think that's really vital. Um, we've got so many other areas of the, of the city that um, we can still do uh, development and mid, particularly mid-density development as well. So I think we can focus on that and preserve um, our heritage and history as well. Great, thank you. And over to you, Doha. Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, so I, I agree with um, a lot of what the other candidates have said. And I do have to say that these buildings are an absolutely integral part of the culture of Adelaide. And they play a massive role in making our city so unique. Um, there's something that we pass on from generation to generation, um, but there's definitely a discussion needed about how we can retrofit these buildings to be more accessible and meet the needs of the community. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, now we've got a question from uh, our online forum, and this one's from Sam, and he's asking, what are your thoughts on the 24-7 dry areas that affect the homeless and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. So we've got uh, Malvina first, um, over to you. Thanks, I'll be quick. Um, I think it's a ridiculous policy. It's not actually addressing um, issues in a meaningful way. It's discriminatory and it's just trying to shift people um, elsewhere. You know, it's the whole approach of out of sight, out of mind. Um, and I think it's a little bit disgusting. And instead of perhaps acknowledging that um, a problem exists and trying to fix it in a meaningful way, it's just trying to move it on without providing any access um, to support. Um, and it's also, again, hugely discriminatory. We've got, um, you know, public events in the parklands. You've got family picnics where people are consuming alcohol and it's not policed in any way near the same fashion. So yeah, it's absolutely discriminatory and it has to go. Thank you. Um, and then hand to Gareth, followed by Greg. 
Well, I won't take up any of your time. I think uh, Malvina 100% hit the nail on the head. Um, I echo all of her sentiments and uh, and support the removal of uh, that kind of discriminatory and draconian um, uh, policy. Okay, Kay, over to you, Greg. Thanks, Matt. Um, one of the joys of having been around for a while is that I was around when the big fight was on uh, between 2000 and 2002 uh, regarding the declaring of dry zones uh, across the city. Now, I took a very, very highly principled position that the implementation of the dry zone would be fundamentally racist in its uh, practice. And there is nothing that I have seen in the last 20 years that gives me any uh, uh, cause to change my perspective about that. It is a complex issue. Substance misuse in the public realm is a complex issue. There was supposed to be a massive investment in support services at the time of the bringing on of the dry zone. There was some lip service paid to that, but it was not properly done. If we want an alcohol free city uh, and a substance free city, we're going to have to take a very, very different approach because this is not a this is not a law and order thing. This is a medical thing. This is a psychological thing. And um, I don't yet see that our city, uh, our state, our, our nation has the maturity to um, come to grips with this incredibly complex question. Doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying. Does not mean we shouldn't keep trying. Thank you, Greg. Um, we're going to move. Sorry, did Darren want to say something about that? Sorry, over to you, Darren. No? Um, no, no, Greg covered it nicely. <laughs> Sweet. Um, the next question from our forum is uh, from Shane, and he's asking how can the Central Ward become the engine room for South Australia's economic bounce back? Okay, Greg. Okay, my uh, this this is my my hot topic, guys. Um, there is this thing called the cultural economy, and it's not much well uh, well understood um, because we think of the arts and we understand what the arts sector is, and we understand how the arts play a part in festivals. Uh, but culture is everything that we do as human beings. Uh, culture is retail. Retail is the lifeblood of the city centre. Retail is not only the lifeblood of the CBD, it's actually the vital part of the City of Adelaide's cultural economy. And what do I mean by cultural economy? It's, it's not only the arty farty stuff, as I said, the cultural economy is retail, the cultural economy is entertainment, it's partying and commemorating. And while it might, might not be my cup of tea, the cultural economy is also gambling and pokies. The cultural economy is our conventions, our festivals, our major events, it's Wyoming Adelaide, it's all the multicultural festivals, even faith-based communion, for those who share religious beliefs. The cultural economy drives visitation into the CBD. The cultural economy fills car parks. It, it generates revenue for council and then council invests that back with its capital city hat on in order to support and encourage the further growth and development of the cultural economy. For that, and we've got Nathan and Stuart, and then I've got what I think is the most important question of the night for the candidates. So Nathan. Uh, uh, thanks, Matt. Look, I mean, the, the central ward is the economic heart of South Australia. It is, it is where uh, the majority of our white collar uh, businesses are, are housed. It's where the majority of our uh, white collar workers uh, come every day for work when, when we're not shut down. Um, on top of that, it is, the, you know, it is these businesses that pay the bulk of the, the rates in the city of Adelaide. So they're not just uh, they're not just critical in terms of being able to provide employment for people. They're also critical in terms of being able to provide uh, finances for the council to to spend money on other programs. Our first and our first and foremost priority has to be protecting those ratepayers, supporting those non-residential ratepayers who are struggling right now. We need to make sure that they can open their doors up again uh, as we as we exit this crisis. Uh, and that has to be our number one goal, and that has to be our number one aim. Everything else can come later. Just handing over to Stuart and then followed by Darren. Okay, intrigued what the most interest, uh, the most important question is. Um, I think Adelaide's got to be, the, um, it's got to be a place to be where people want to be. So not, not for the young 
people to want to move into state or overseas, not, not go to Henley Square, not go to Semaphore. You know, Adelaide's got to be you know, the place. Um, to do this it needs to be made exciting, interesting, progressive. So you know, th those are things that I'd definitely like to see to make it that place. Thank you, Stuart, and over to you, Darren. The central water already is, by large, the, the engine room of our economy. Uh, we have, most large companies like to have their offices in the central ward. Um, we're losing a few, um, and we're about to lose a couple more. Santos is obviously moving its offices, and that's not good. So we need to take a multi multifunctional approach, which is we need to make the city a great place for workers to work, which means if you want to ride a bike in, that's good, you can do that. If you want to catch a bus, the transport's good, you can do that. Uh, it's a nice place to go out and have lunch. It's a nice place to, to live and be around during your working hours. And we want companies to have that to be able to offer to their employees. We also need to make it and add a little bit of prestige back to the city. We need to make it so that companies don't decide to go out to the suburbs to, to put their offices on Greenville Road or wherever it happens to be. We don't want them to go down to the Tonsley Industrial Park. We want them to be in the city of Adelaide. So we need to, we need to make it more prestigious again. And, you know, there's a variety of ways that we can do that. Thanks for that. And the last question of the night, and you won't take need a minute to answer this, but where is the best place to get a coffee in the central ward? I got, I got Gareth, over to you. Uh, the best place to get a coffee in the central ward is Hey Jupiter. It's a, it's a great place. Thank you. Um, handing over to uh, Darren. I don't really drink coffee, but uh, I, I hear there's a pub on King William Street that does an awesome gluten-free chicken schnitzel. <laughs> that's, that's all I got to add. Thank you. Um, I think Nathan was next. Nathan? Sorry, you're on mute. Sorry, start again. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, Bonobo on Bank Street, I think, is uh, crushing it for me at the moment. But there are many, many great places to get coffees, and I'm looking forward to more reopening their doors pretty soon. Uh, uh, Greg? Uh, cultural politics is a very, very interesting thing. I'm sure we all understand this. And choosing your favourite coffee uh, is as about as complex a, a cultural <laughs> political question as, as any. Um, I've had great coffees in many places. Um, I, I absolutely agree. Hey Jupiter is a sublime coffee. So I'm absolutely with you there, Gareth. Um, I actually do pretty good coffee, get pretty good coffee down uh, by the River Torrens um, at uh, Lounders Boatshed Cafe. Um, when it finally gets to reopen, I will be a happy man. Right. And I guess if there's some non-coffee drinkers that haven't answered the question, is there anything else that's helping you get through COVID-19 that's uh, open and doing takeaway in town, Doha? Big fan of the of the salads down at Levan Eatery. Uh, would recommend those. Fantastic, fantastic, and Malvina. Yep. Uh, so also not a huge uh, coffee drinker, but I have to say, my kingdom for a horse has really left an impression for me, and I miss them dearly. But also, um, huge shout out to Spark, who are continuing to do an amazing job with their delivery service, and they're a woman-led brewery in the heart of the CBD. Um, who support uh, progressive causes as well. So what's not to love? Right. And uh, lastly, we've got uh, Stuart. Um, and I think I've been to the punch there. I'm, I'm a very big beer fan. So uh, Spark was going to get my vote. What they've done there is just fantastic. And I'm just so looking forward to going back there. Great. Well, I just want to thank uh, candidates. This concludes our Q&A session. And I, I really want to thank you for your good humour and your good grace uh, through this uh, Zoom process uh, that we've been through. Um, with COVID-19 placing many restrictions on public gatherings and person-to-person -person contact, there have been limited opportunities for candidates to meet with their local community uh, and promote their vision for the central ward. Um, I hope those of you tuning in have found this session useful 
And please remember that the ballot will close on Monday, the 11th of May. And please see the EXA website for any further information. I now call this forum closed and I thank you all for your participation. Sorry.